It's quite different to what I have today. It's, uh, to be honest, it's a bit, uh, looking at my points, rehearsing it the last two nights, it's a bit uh, all over the place. It's like a schizophrenic, so. But we'll go through it. Um, I do have the names in the Bible. Whoa, feedback. Um, but for the first half, it's more like cool stories in the Bible and, and the names that we can hear and uh, learn from that. So I'm not usually the one that's preaching here, so if you're a visitor here this morning, uh, obviously I'm just here to fill in, you know, Victor sometimes, uh, just to give Victor a break. But I'm really excited this morning. Uh, for the past few months, you know, um, uh, I've surrounded myself with other believers, um, and a pastor had to go once, and men filled their place and preached in his, in his place, and they couldn't preach as well as him, obviously, and they were stumbling, they were going through the notes, and sometimes there was pauses, but... When you, when you get around with uh, God's people and they, they get excited to hear the Word of God and you hear uh, even through you know, quiet moments and times where it's, uh, he's, he's stumbling, he doesn't seem fully prepared, yet you hear everyone say Amen and get excited for the Word of God. That's the people who I'm thinking are before me this morning. And so I just thank you. I thank you guys for being here. Uh, we're here in the house of God to learn. And I hope to bring that culture where we're, we're so excited, we can't, say, we can't stay quiet. We sing the things of God and we're, we're, so, we're so happy. All right, so if, uh, going on with the sermon, <clears throat> the thing that I want to speak about is uh, names in the Bible. So I wanted to address, to, I get to a point where we address the, you know, the, the, the names written in the book of life and uh, God's name. So hopefully we get to that. It is a bit lengthy, but a lot of names in the Bible, obviously. Uh, we have a lot of, um, you know, someone begat someone and such and such begat so much. So many of those, uh, so long chapters, right? And then sometimes when you read those chapters, you're like, oh, should I just skip this chapter? But, you know, those are important. You know, you see the lineages sometimes of the kings and eventually to Christ. So although like those names are very hard to read and some of, sometimes we get it wrong, uh, we have those in the Bible. But um, first point I wanted to bring today is uh, people, places and things, you know, names, uh, God has given us freedom to make names, and uh, the one I, I guess that would be interesting for the kids is in Genesis two. Let's quickly read it. Uh, and the Lord said, and the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make and help meet for him. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air, and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found an help meet for him. And the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam and he slept and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh thereof, uh, closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And God said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. <coughs> so we jump back a bit uh, for... I guess the younger ones, and you know, today you hear uh, in, taught in, in schools and in, in college about evolution and how, um, you know, evolution we have, we, we came from, you know, the, the, the great apes and all that, but obviously we don't in the count of Genesis 1 and 2. But here now we have the names of the animals. Uh, so God, what I, what I have thought here is, you know, if we have a Calvinistic God, wouldn't he have just told Adam, these are the names of the animals? Like he's bringing Adam, here's the elephant, here's the lion, here's the, well, obviously he didn't name it. He's like, here's these animals. And so he comes the sheep. Well, obviously he wasn't named sheep yet. But then Adam's like, all right, that is a sheep. That is a lion. Uh, that is an elephant. That is a giraffe. So God's giving Adam the free will to name the animals. And so if we'd live, if we did serve a Calvinistic God, he would have just told Adam straight away, uh, these are the names of the animals. But we have in the text that uh, Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And, what, sorry, and whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. So it was Adam that named the creatures. Obviously, we don't know the language he spoke then, uh, like in terms of phonetically how he spoke him, because uh, that was way back then, right? So even the Hebrew and the Greek that we... Um, I've spoken today is slightly different to back then so that would have been interesting to hear you know maybe when we get to heaven we'll hear uh this creation story and the account of adam and, and eve uh that would have been interesting and in how these animals you know behemoth um and great animals we probably don't see anymore adam got to see them and name them i thought that was pretty cool all right so adam uh, got to name the animals 
And he also named woman. You know, there's that story where um, it's, it's sort of a running joke in Christian circles where, you know, the reason why he called woman is like he saw Ad, when he saw um, uh, the woman, he's like, whoa, man. Right? So that's the usual thing. But he called, she shall be called woman. And so that Adam was to be able to uh, name the woman woman. But what I find interesting also is that uh, she didn't have a name until even later, you know, maybe Adam slept on it or he thought he procrastinated in that sense. Uh, so even the, the serpent that uh, beguiled Eve, she wasn't called Eve at the time, it was actually later. It says in Genesis 3, 20, and I won't go through the story, but basically this is way after that. Um, and Adam called his wife's name Eve. So Adam once again got to name uh, Eve Eve. And that was way after. So sometimes parents, uh, when their child is born, they, they're not prepared or they're like, oh, how, how do I name it? Because they're, they're, so, they're so worried about um, giving that permanent name to that person, right? They want to be known by that name. And so they, sometimes they pause and take a while, a few days to write the name. But so that likewise with Adam here, it took him a while to name um, his wife's name Eve. All right, so from there, we just have that uh, God gave the freedom to Adam to name the names uh, for the animals and even to Eve. All right, moving on, God gives us the free will to also give names to places, and uh, there's a few applications I want to take from this as well. It says this in Exodus uh, 16, 15. And when the children of Israel saw it, they said one to another, it is manna. So this is talking about the, the bread from heaven. So God didn't directly um, tell them this is what it is. This is the name of it. The children of Israel got to name um, the, that bread uh, that came down from heaven or the bread-like thing that came from heaven it is manna for they wist not what it was and Moses said unto them uh, this is the bread which the Lord hath given you to eat all right so in Exodus same uh, the next um, passage a bit later it says and, um, and the house of Israel called the name thereof manna and it was like coriander seed white and the taste of it was like wafers made with honey so that would be nice and interesting to eat you know we have sourdough and some good breads um, a good plug to Morning Hit, you know, they got some good breads out there, and the people that work there make some great sandwiches, right? So, but this one is, um, we, we got to see the Israelites, they made, um, they called the name thereof uh, manna, so they got to name the name. So sometimes, uh, in many places, God uh, gives us the names, in some cases, we get to name the things, right? So we have the free will to name things. And regarding things and places, we have a, um, all of a place, uh, Genesis 22, let's read this story here. And Isaac spoke unto Abraham, his father, and said, My father. And he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood. But where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, my son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went, both of them, together, and they came to the place which God had told him of. And Abraham built an altar there, and laid the wood in order, and bound Isaac his son, and laid him on the, on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand, and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, uh, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his thorns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him, a, up a burnt, uh, sorry, and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh. As it is said today, um, in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. So <clears throat> we have that, um, there's a song I, used to, I, I like recently, Jehovah Jireh. And um, when I think about it now, uh, it's not what the, maybe it's just how I, I hear the song. Um, it said, when I was reading this, uh, sorry, when I was trying to search for the definition of Jireh, and what it meant, it's usually tied in a lot of um, internet websites that says, uh, the Lord will provide. You know, sometimes you hear in charismatic circles that Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. He is my provider. But when I read this story in this account, I actually don't think that's the meaning of the, the word Jehovah Jireh or the, of the meaning of the place. Uh, as it is said today, the, in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. So what I understand it to be is the definition of Jehovah Jireh is that it shall be seen. And in some... Um, uh, websites when I was trying to search the definition of Jireh, they actually say it that way that it actually means uh, to be seen or it shall be seen as we see here as Moses is writing this at that time um, but I guess that song you know I don't know if you've heard that song because I love that song it's such a, most of the song is very scriptural but now that I think like oh is it Jehovah Jireh, are they calling him the provider? But I don't think that's what it means here in Genesis 22 but you know it's like the Jehovah Jireh 
my provider, his grace is sufficient for me, for me, for me. And he talks about, my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. He shall give his angels charge over thee. Jehovah Jireh uh, cares for me, right? So, but I hope I can see that song now that it's, uh, that maybe they're just calling that place and, uh, um, and that we're just remembering that God provided himself a lamb. I like that song, but I don't think that's what the meaning of Jehovah Jireh means. It's to, in the mount of the Lord, it shall be seen. And so, um, in that case, you know, we have uh, names of a place. And I want to get back to this because the reason why I picked this out is uh, in Genesis 22, and we'll see a bit later in, uh, in the name of God about uh, Jehovah and his name and how he's seen to the Israelites, what was his name. And so we'll address this. But we see here Jehovah, uh, the name of God in Genesis 22. Let's just keep a mental note of that. I don't want to address it just yet. But moving on, um, <clears throat> the names of places continuing on. And when the people complained, it pleased the Lord, and the Lord heard it, and his, angered, uh, sorry, and his anger was kindled, and the fire of the Lord burnt among them, and consumed them that were in the uttermost parts of the camp. And the people cried unto Moses, and when Moses prayed unto the Lord, the fire was quenched, and he called the name of the place Taborah, because, of the, because the fire of the Lord burnt among them. So this place, you know, we have uh, in this uh, story, you know, the Israelites, all, throughout you know, the time in the, in the wilderness, they're, they're always complaining, the people that complained. And I always thought, you know, um, there's that contrasting thought where the Lord uh, teaches about being the importunate friend, right? You want to go to that, when you're praying to God, you've got to be the person that's like, God, uh, he's, he's going at midnight, he's going at the, you know, the, the, uh, he's just being importunate, he's always going to God and asking like, give me, give me the bread, give me, give me what I need. And so they always... I always have that thought like, you know, we have here the Israelites complaining, weren't they just doing the same thing where they're just talking to God? But what I think about the difference is, is when, when it's more of the attitude, right? When people complain, it's usually uh, an attitude of, um, you know, arrogance, like, oh, why did God do that? Why did this happen? Why is this, you know, they're just angry. They're just filled with, um, in that contempt in that sense where they, they're not um, approaching God uh, in an importunate way where they're just, uh, in a sense, begging. Where like they're saying, oh God, I really need this. Please, Lord, please help me. Help me overcome this. Pray you provide. Whereas the Israelites, they're more like, they were complainers. They're more like, oh God, why is he doing this to us? Why isn't he giving us... You know, when we were in Israel, uh, sorry, when we were in Egypt, you know, we had such good food and we we're taken care of. They're, they're full of complaint. So there's a difference in contrast there. And so you don't want to be someone that's complaining. You want to be someone um, like the importunate friend that goes to God in meekness and humility, knowing that it is God who provides you. You know, he will take care of you if you go to him. And so we have in this story um, that his anger was kindled, kindled and the fire of the Lord burnt among them and consumed them that were in the uttermost parts of the camp. So also you think about, uh, I don't know if you heard in Christian circles where they say, you know, you've got to be on fire for God. You know, you've got to go stand, make a stand for God. You've got to be a Christian that's on fire. But if you think about the fire of God, it usually means it's a judgment of God, right? Remember, you think of uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, you think of uh, Mount Carmel, and um, God sent down that fire that even consumed the water. And so these things, uh, fire is usually a picture of, uh, you know, the judgment of God. So I don't think that's probably the right analogy to use, like being on fire for God. Uh, I know I get what you mean, like, you know, you want to be zealous, you want to be on, um, you want to be working for God, you want to stand up for God, but... Uh, maybe you guys have a scripture that I don't know, that uh, uh, I don't know to remembrance yet, uh, how to be on fire for God in a good way. Um, maybe the, you know, the cloven tongues uh, like a fire that stood on them in Acts 2, or uh, maybe the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, but they weren't really on fire, right? They were like in the fire, but they weren't on fire. But yeah, so not, not to, uh, that, I guess that phrase, you'll be on fire for God is, it sort of takes the, 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 uh, the nick of it, right? But to be zealous for God is what we should be, and not to be people complaining, as we see here in, um, uh, in, in Numbers 11, because the Lord will hear it, and His anger is kindled, right? So although He's uh, full of mercy and grace, um, you know, there is a point where He'll treat us as children, and um, He'll deal with us accordingly. And so that place uh, was called Taborah. And um, so there is a reason why I got these names and places and names of people soon. There'll be a common point. So we have names of people, animals, things, uh, places God's given us, allow allowed us. The next story I want to draw from um, in 1 Samuel 1, and I know I'm sort of going quick here because 
looks to me like I've got a, quite a lot of notes I want to get through. But I will slow down soon. So 1 Samuel chapter 1. Um, and they rose up in the morning early and worshipped before the Lord and returned and came to their house, oh, sorry, and came to their house to Ramah. And Elkanah knew Hannah his wife, and the Lord remembered her. Wherefore it came to pass, when the time was come, about after Hannah had conceived, that she bare a son and called his name Samuel, Samuel saying, Because I have asked him of the Lord. Uh, I'll come back to this, but let's read Genesis 4 26. And to Seth, to Seth, to him also, there was born a son, and he called his name Enos. Then began man to call upon the name of the Lord. So we have here the the wife or the mother naming the child Samuel uh, and uh, in this case it was uh, the father but let's uh, go to back to back to here and the, the point I really want to draw from these names in this point uh, coming up to this you know the names of things places um, you got I want you guys to um, if you think of the story of what Hannah had to go through you know she was she was um, barren basically and she was obviously worried and she even prayed where uh, the priest Eli was, thought she was drunken, remember? Like he, her mouth was moving, but he, he couldn't hear. And so she was just sorrowful that she wanted a child. And that's why we have his name Samuel, because I have asked him of the Lord. So in your mind, if you're ever having a hard time with troubles, uh, or um, just count your blessings, right? So we have that song, count your blessings, name them one by one. Right? So that song, and... When you're in the valleys and the downtimes, you know, you've got to be thankful for God, thankful for the victories, you know, counting your blessings, remembering the names and the times and the places where God has done uh, great victories for you. Because, uh, you know, there's times of troubles where sometimes you don't want to hear of anything or you, want to, you don't want to, sometimes you can't be ministered to. But when you remember how good and great God has done for you in your life, uh, sometimes it'll just help you up. Uh, so, for example, I, had a, I have a story, I won't name the name, um, but in my old church, um, we went to um, we went to as a group a pretty big group we went to Sri Lanka um, to help start a church in the, the east side of Sri Lanka and for one week we were doing um, you know outreach we we're trying to get people like hey we're gonna start a church here um, we want you guys to come and so that week was great the whole two weeks was great actually uh, we got to start a church in the east side um, a pastor was ready to set, stay there, a native pastor. And so that was interesting. Um, but the, for some of us that came out of that, you know, we're, we are, have zealous for God. Where For the first couple of months, we're just, we're, we're just on the high for God, right? We just saw what God has done in Sri Lanka. But that fades off, that wears away, right? We come back to the things in the, in the schedule of our lives and we sometimes forget and we get carried about the things of life. Um, but there's a particular brother where, you know, he was the one that, uh, he gave a testimony there. Um, his testimony is what his, um, his wife, basically, um, she experienced a miscarriage. And so when he was explaining, explaining his experience with God there, you know, people, the people, uh, the Sri Lankans there, they, they, they responded well. You know, they thought, wow, like, God helped you through that. He can help us through it right now. And so that brother, though, um, after, a short time after, uh, coming back, you know, there was this time he was struggling a bit. He was missing church sometimes, and uh, <clears throat> and um, and even his dad could see he was he was struggling with uh, marriage in some cases. So his dad came to us in in a prayer meeting, and he said, you know, um, pray for my son. Um, I just think he's having a time hard time. So the next couple of weeks, he had that we had that prayer meeting, and he's saying, you know, pray for my son. Please pray for him, and we'd see him every now and then, but. It's not the same as when he came out of Sri Lanka. He was just, he, was, had, he had a zeal like I've never seen before in a while. But now that I see him then, it was a bit hard to hear and see him how he is. Anyways, he came one time, uh, and one of the leaders that came to him, and he said, he went up to him, he's like, brother, your dad is praying for you. He's like, puts his hand on he's like, do you remember Sri Lanka? And I could feel the emotion in his eyes. When he was telling me, he came to me, did this really happen? Did, did my dad, he came to me and he says, did my dad say that to pray for me? I was like, yes, brother. He did. So sometimes when you go down through the hard times, you just got to remember the, the victory God has given. You know, you might be hard, having a hard time now. You might be not being faithful right now or struggling. But you can remember what God has done for you, right? 
And from that day onwards, that brother, he's like, oh, I thank you. I thank God for my dad. And he started serving God. You know, from that day, he was on fire. I haven't seen him in a while, but, you know, he was leading the youth. Since then, he was doing some, some great things for God. He remembered. He, named, he remembered Sri Lanka. He remembered Sri Lanka. Like as Hannah remembered Samuel. And as we have Jehovah Jireh, name that place, name that victory. And God, out of the hard times and the struggles, he will help you. He will help you. Oh, didn't mean to get emotional there, but it just happened to be. All right, so <clears throat> hopefully that helped you as well. Exodus 15, let's continue on. So Moses brought uh, Israel from the Red Sea and they went down to the wilderness of Shur. And they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. And when they came to Marah, they could not drink of the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. Therefore, the name of it was called Marah. And the people murmured against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? And he cried unto the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree, uh, which he had cast into the waters, and the waters were made sweet. Uh, there he made for them a statute and an ordinance, and there he proved them, and said, If thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and wilt do that which is right in his sight, and wilt give ear to his commandments, and keep all his statutes, I will put none of these diseases upon thee, which I have brought upon thee, upon the Egyptians, for I the Lord that healeth thee. And, when, and they came to Elim, there were twelve wells of water, and three score, and ten palm trees, and they encamped there by their waters. So we have the name here, Mara in Exodus, which uh, means basically bitter. And if you remember the story in Ruth, um, Naomi, if you read um, earlier in the chapter, she lost her husband, and she lost her two sons, and so she's now with her two daughter-in-laws, and Ruth um, just decided to stay with her. And uh, Naomi was obviously very sad, you know, she lost her husband and two, two sons, she has to take care of her two daughter-in-laws, telling them, you know, should I bear more children? That they'll, would, you, would you wait a while? You'd be willing, well, I can't bear any ch children, I'm old. And so when she comes back to her city, uh, she said, you know, call me not Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty hath dealt very bitterly with me. And that's sometimes how we feel. Um, you know, sometimes you go through the hard times or you're go, just going through struggles and trials. Um, but don't be... Um, just remember the victories God has given you in your life. Remember those times and those places. Name those names. Name those places. And count your blessings. Because if you remember at the end of Ruth, if you read, continue on, um, basically what's born of, her, of Ruth, and it's sort of accounted, uh, attributed to Naomi, uh, there were uh, Boaz and Ruth. They gave birth to um, Obed, and Obed gave birth to Jesse, and Jesse gave birth to, obviously, David. And so... Uh, for you ladies out there, I guess, if you've been given children, right? Imagine your child, um, you know, being one of the great ones, right? Like, I could just, if you could picture, uh, I guess in a Christian sense, that your, if your child grew up and became a great preacher, uh, he stood and he won many souls and, and all that, you'd be happy, right? You'd be great. Um, and likewise with David, if, if Naomi knew that David would come out from her, you know, how excited would you be? Like, wow, king? You know, so don't be um, fixed or over reacting in the, in the times of trouble uh, don't call um, don't um, be bitter so much about it where we hear her, Naomi saying call me Mara for the Almighty have dealt very bitterly with me you know likewise we see here what did they do in Exodus uh, even though that place was uh, bitter and they couldn't drink of it they cried to lo the Lord and so he cast the trees and made the water sweet All right so we always go back to God and just be patient and um, just wait, wait on the Lord, and he will help thee. All right, so continuing on, Genesis 17. And when Abram was 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram and said, uh, <clears throat> sorry, just looking at the notes, and said unto him, I am the almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. All right, so remember when I said in Genesis 22, we had Jehovah Jireh, but in this sense, Genesis 17, we see almighty God. So we have the two uh, different... I guess, names of God. Um, we'll address that a bit later. I am the almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. And I will make my covenant between me and thee and will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abraham and Abram fell on his face and God talked with him saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Neither shall thy name be any more be called Abraham, Abram, but thy name shall be called Abraham. For a father of many nations have I made thee. So uh, I won't continue on, but a few verses there. 
Uh, basically, God changed Abram's name to Abraham. So name changes can happen. Uh, this is not fixed, right? So let's not get fixated on the, the ordering of the letters here. But God made the covenant with Abraham uh, that he will make him exceeding fruitful. Uh, he will make of him um, a father of many nations. You know that, that song that's Father Abraham had many sons. And, and that song is, uh, the, the kids like that song, right? Because you always just think like all these, all these uh, cool things, right? But he is a father of many nations. Um, the thing I want to draw from this is, you know, in Galatians 3, it's uh, but of one seed, right? You didn't say of thy seeds, but of thy seed. So many nations, uh, basically, if you are a believer, uh, we are of the children of Abraham, as Galatians 3 says. Um, and so even though, if you remember in John, all these Pharisees came to Jesus and says, you know, we're the children of Abraham. It's like, uh, well, even though you can claim physically, you're not, you're of the child of the devil. Right, but if you're a believer in Christ, um, we are of Abraham's seed. Okay, so going on, um, just remember, where was I? The Almighty God, that's a, a name of God we'll come to. All right, so Hosea chapter 1, in that, in that chapter, sorry, in Genesis, we had God changing the name as well. So, God changing the name, it's not fixed. So, Hosea chapter 1, uh, and this is God just giving the name. And we'll see even the name he gives is slightly to the name he actually does give eventually. Uh, the beginning of the word of the Lord by Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, Go, take unto thee a wife of whoredoms and children of whoredoms, for the land hath committed great whoredom, departing from the Lord. And so he went and took Goma, the daughter of Diblaim, which conceived and bare him a son. And the Lord said unto him, Call his name Jezreel. Um, let's continue on. He also had another son later. It's just skipping for the sake of time. Uh, verse 6, And she conceived again and bare a daughter, and God said unto him, Call her name Lorohama, for I will no more have mercy upon the house of Israel, but I will take them away. Um, but if you jump uh, down to verse 8, let's continue on. And when she had weaned Lorohama, she conceived and bare a son, and, get, and said, God, call his name Noami, for ye are not my people, and I will not be your God. So here's a story where God's actually giving the names, uh, whereas... You know, in Genesis, we see people naming people's names and, and giving names. We also see in the story in the Bibles where God actually gives a name. Uh, obviously, the name Jesus, in, in, um, as we see from Angel Gabriel as a messenger of God as well. So God can give names, uh, and so he names people names sometimes. Uh, but don't be fixed with the letter ordering. Um, I don't think that's so important so much, and I'll address that a bit later. Because uh, in even in the Gospels, um, sometimes the names uh, are slightly different, but it's about who, who we can identify, right? That's what the names are. They're supposed to identify a person, uh, to know who a person is. And so in, in, in the New Testament, sometimes you have surnames as well, to be more specific, like this person. Uh, is, and this person by the last name, or you know, this person... Um, we see a surname so we can further identify as long as we know and God knows obviously uh, the names written in heaven that he, he, he knows those names uh, but Matthew 10 we have the disciples um, Simon who's called Peter and Andrew his brother and James the son of Zebedee so, uh, and John his brother Philip and Bartholomew Thomas and, and Matthew the publican James the son of Alphaeus and Lebaeus whose surname was Thaddeus so remember that surname Simon the Canaanite and Judas Iscariot who betrayed him so the 12 disciples Mark 3 has a slightly diff uh, similar order. Um, some of the names are slightly different. Um, but what I found cool is uh, in verse 17, James the son of Zebedee and John the brother of James, and he surnamed uh, them Boanerges, which is the sons of thunder. So that's a pretty cool uh, reason why, like the sons of thunder, right? Um, but yeah, so I've got this chart in a way. Uh, if you guys want it a bit later, there's also a few websites that have it. But basically, I've highlighted the... Um, how they're named and the order and actually how they're presented in, in their gospel. So the names are different. Uh, look at that uh, Labaius and Thaddeus. It's also Judas is James' bro, brother. Sorry, I didn't say brother there, but bro. Um, but yeah, so the names, they're not always fixed. So even in, in the, the gospels, you know, the true account witnesses, these names, uh, God knows the names, right? So as long as the, your name is written in the book of life, uh, he knows that name. He knows the name he's talking about. He knows who you are. And um, we'll get to that. Isaiah 44. Uh, moving on. Where am I in my notes? 
uh, one shall say, oh yeah, sorry, so surnames. Uh, one shall say, I am the Lord's, and another shall call himself by the name of Jacob, and another shall subscribe with a ha his hand unto the Lord and surname himself by the name of Israel. So, you know, like YouTube, you subscribe, um, like and subscribe. But here in this case, uh, and surname himself by the name of Israel. And so the thought I have here this morning, uh, like, you know, as Christians, as believers, obviously, uh, we're subscribing, uh, sorry, we're surnaming ourselves by the name of Israel. You know, we are the people of God. So we want to be excited, be, um, you know, always looking forward to surrounding ourselves with Christians when church time comes, when times of um, going out with other believers, you know, we have the Christian fellowship meetings. Uh, we should be um, looking forward to those things. I want to surname myself. I want to be known to other people that I am a Christian. I'm not, you know, you know I know the Panthers won last week, but I'm not a Panther even though I grew up in the West. I'm not a, of the, you know, my son plays soccer for uh, Plumpton Oakus. I'm not of them. I'm going to surname myself of the name by the name of Israel. I want to be around God's people. I want to be where God's word is open, where his word is preached, and I want to hear the singing praises of his name. That is who I'm going to surname myself. If you want to identify me, I'm going to surname myself by the name of Israel. I'm going to be with God's people. And so that's the thought I wanted to share with you. You know, you guys, um, all of us really should be uh, excited, even though you know, we might be awkward or we don't uh, feel the same about with each other. We have the common ground, that is Jesus Christ. And we ought to be willing and um, excited to be around God's people. So let's surname ourselves, you know, in this sense, as the Lord is saying, surname himself by the name of Israel. Let's surname ourselves with God, God's people. Be identified in that sense that we are known as God's people. I am known as God, a child of God. I am surrounded by the, um, God's people. And so with reputations or surnames, uh, we also have bywords, right? Um, and so I'll read... Yeah, okay. So I'll read the next uh, three verses here. Psalm 44, verse 14. Regarding Israel, thou makest us a byword among the heathen, a shaking of the head among the people. Uh, 1 Kings 9 7. Then will I cut off Israel out of the land which I give, have given them, and this house which I have hollowed for my name will I cast out of my sight, and Israel shall be a proverb and a byword among all people. And also we have Job. He says, Job 30 verse 9. And now am I their song? Yea, uh, yea I am their byword. So byword, you know, this is like the original memes. Right? You know, you have. In social media these days, people post memes. Uh, byword is basically in that sense that, that one encapsulates that word. Uh, the byword, right? So uh, if you think about Israel, you know, they were sort of memed in that sense, like, you know, is God going to destroy them? You know, they went against God, God destroyed them, they had that cycle. Uh, they turned back to God, and uh, God helped them out of the, um, the troubles that they faced, you know, the, the, the kingdoms that um, fought against them. And likewise with Job, you know, he... Um, usually when you're featured in a song, you know, you hear popular songs these days of, um, they sometimes feature popular names in their songs um, And usually it's something that you are excited about like wow, like he's invoking the name um, of you know, this important person and for those worldly people they would know, right? Like if you're featured in a song, that's usually a cool thing But in this sense with Job, uh, he's featured in their songs because he's, he's going through trouble and trials, right? He just, he lost their, their um, uh, he lost his family, he lost a lot of wealth, a lot of possession, but obviously, most importantly, his family, and he's, he's sorrowful, and he's saying, and now am I their song? Hey, I am their byword. So the reputation or the, the thing when they, when they invoke uh, Job's name, you know, they, they know Job is, is uh, having trouble. And so his friends, or the people that were trying to counsel him, they thought maybe it was your sins, maybe you're doing something against God, God's punishing you for something, but obviously... Uh, it wasn't the case, but that's, this is how Job feels, that he is, um, in that sense, that byword for them, that people are, um, in a sense, teasing him, memeing against Job. So we have uh, names that can be surnames as well to further identify, and also um, uh, bywords to also, uh, in that sense, like we know who that person is, like encapsulates the spirit of him and uh, what they're going through. <coughs> you know, the, you think of popular... If I was to say, like, you know, Apple, when it comes to technology, right, you, you wouldn't usually think of uh, the, the food Apple, but you'd think of, you know, Apple, the big giant, the giant tech company. So their reputation uh, sort of exceeds their name. And so hopefully, you know, we have a good... Um, I'm excited for our church, really. You know, we have a lot of young people. I think in 10, 15 years' time, uh, we'll see um, the church in Liverpool will be, 
You know, when our kids are growing up and working for God, I think we'll, we'll be of something great. You know, we should be excited for that. And uh, we'll have a, a good name behind that, you know. A good name is, chosen, uh, is rather to be chosen than great riches, right? We'll get to that, Proverbs 22. But Judges 9, uh, here's another, in a sense, um, byword or a meme, like uh, Abimelech is a popular one in, in the Old Testament. And Abimelech came unto the tower and fought against it and went hard unto the door of the tower to burn it with fire. And a certain woman cast a piece of a millstone upon Abimelech's head and all to break his skull. And he called hastily unto the young man, his bearer, armor bearer, and said unto him, Draw thy sword and slay me, that they say not of me, a woman slew me. And his young man thrust him through and he died. So he didn't want to be killed of a woman, right? So he's like, you know what? Kill me. I don't want people to know that I died of a woman. And, uh, you know, the whole gender um, debates these days, and you hear like of... Um, you know, women should be paid more than, should be paid the same as men. You know, these soccer teams, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, I think I was watching a video two months ago where it was these, uh, even older men that are sort of semi-retired that were, were professional uh, soccer players. Uh, they played up against uh, one of the national teams, I think it was Team USA, and they actually beat them pretty convincingly. Like, it was, it was such a, a, a big, a big beatdown. Because um, a man losing to a woman in that sense, you know, it's, uh, you see all the comments like, man, why didn't they win by a hundred? You know, so it's like sort of that thing where, um, don't kill me, uh, and Abimelech's like, don't kill me, I don't want a woman to kill me. I don't want to think of a woman to kill me. Well, here we have in Second Samuel 11, that exact uh, thing, right, that by what he is. Uh, Who smote Abimelech, the son of a uh, Jerubesheth? Uh, Did not a woman cast a piece of millstone upon him from the wall that he died in Thebes? So he's... Uh, his story, what he's known for, is actually being killed by a woman, even though he didn't want that to happen, right? So I thought that was funny or interesting in that sense that his reputation, uh, his, in, the, in a memeing sense, that he um, was known to be killed by a woman. And uh, Drew Besheth is uh, also Gideon, his, which is what we'll segue into. Um, and he's the one that gave birth to Abimelech. So it says here, the son of Drew Besheth. Uh, if you remember Judges 6, our text passage will get, soon, get to soon. Uh, but Judges 8, And Gideon had three score and ten sons of his body begotten. If he had many wives and his concubine that was in Shechem, she also bare him a son whose name uh, he called Abimelech. So that's where we see that story, Abimelech in the tower. But let's go back to our text, Judges 6. And when Gideon perceived uh, that he was an angel of the Lord, Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God, for, I have, um, for because I have seen an angel of the Lord face to face, and the Lord said unto him, Peace be unto thee, fear not, thou shalt not die. And then Gideon built an altar there unto the Lord and called it Jehovah Shalom. All right, so here we have that name once again. If you've um, got a victory for God, or if you've seen or experienced God, remember that. All right, so we're going to continue. Uh, I'm going to skip a few verses for the sake of time. Um, but as you read, we read early in the text, um, <coughs> Gideon, uh, God told him to break down the altar and the groves. Um, and, and to take the two bullocks, right? And so the, the lesson I wanted to stay, st uh, draw from this was, uh, let's jump to, what is the verse? Um, sorry. Basically when he was scared. Um, oh, sorry, here it is, verse 27. And then Gideon took ten men of his servants and did as the Lord had said unto him. And so it was because he feared his father's household and the men of the city, that he could not do it by day, that he did it by night. So he's fearful, right? Sometimes when uh, you know what God should do, uh, you should do for God, but you're scared, um, you know, you ought to find a way. You know, Gideon, although he was, he was scared, he was fearful, he found a way to do it. He found a way to do it. And that seems what, what Gideon was, right? Remember later on in the chapter, it talks about the fleece. God did uh, answer uh, the sign. And then he's like, wait, wait, God, let me, just one more time, please. And then he did it again. So it seems like Gideon, as a person that was scared, but yeah, he still did what God did, uh, God told him to do. So as believers, as Christians, sometimes, you know, you're scared, like, uh, how do I approach this scenario? How do I talk to people about Jesus? You know, find a way, you know, but always find a way. Always be willing to do it. Put your hand up. Uh, the greatest, um, you know, in some cases, uh, the greatest attributes for a worker is availability. So if you're willing and you will do it, you know, you will have victory. And the other thing I wanted to mention in this uh, while we're here was um, he broke down his father's uh, altar and uh, groves, right? So for you young ones, you know, sometimes uh, 
even for me sometimes with my son you know we're not as adults you know we're not perfect obviously we're still in the flesh we tell you guys to serve God read the Bible memorize sing God's praises for you young ones right um, but sometimes you'll probably see us like you know God dad's not dad's not reading his Bible dad's not praying you know don't um, when you as you grow up you see that in us and just being transparent here but be like uh, Gideon where he'll see the flaws of the, his parents and he'll break down the altars he'll break down the grove and he'll, he'll build an altar for God it's between you children and you and God yourself you know hope you don't put your faith in us what we do we're just flesh um, hopefully we can be good examples to you and we stand up and, and preach the word of God and pray and sing praises of God but for you young kids you know if you see your dad your mom like doing things of the world not caring about the things of God why don't you challenge your parents like dad mom can you read the Bible to me you spend five minutes you know can you pray with me why don't you be that child right you children tell your parents you read the Bible to me can you can you show me something from that can you pray with me dad can you pray with me mom I've got um, something in school is happening I want to learn this or help I pray God will help my friends they're sick you know you children um, you know break down the altars and the groves of your parents in that sense all right so with that in mind I also have Proverbs 22 verse 1 and we'll continue uh, I'll probably leave it there actually closing up because I, I did want to go through the book oh, actually I'll hmm. let's see Proverbs 22 and I'll say this and, we'll, and I'll see how I feel a good name is rather to be chosen than great riches and loving favor rather than silver and gold all right so as believers you know we're, we're in a Western society you know many of us work and I know times are hard you know we sometimes you um, we're questioning whether we'll make ends meet but let's not get carried away by the things of the world let's not get carried away by trying to you know build wealth for ourselves the Bible says a good name is rather to be chosen than great riches for your name is your name among the people that you work with do they know you're a Christian do they know do they, do they know you're a believer do they know that you're willing to stand up for the right causes of God or are you going to be choosing the riches of God are you going to sell Jesus Christ for 30 pieces of silver or are you going to stand up and have your name for the Christ for Christ so a good name is rather to be chosen than great riches so sometimes we fall off we get carried with things of life you know we want to work hard we want to provide for our family but what do you want to serve God rather that you'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord than to have anything of this world <clears throat> this world is only temporary right but what we have in eternal eternally is far greater than what we have here all right so actually let's pump through uh, the book of life and the name of God quickly he that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life but I will confess him before my father and before his angels and some of these verses are self-explanatory uh, so if you're if you're the one that overcometh your name is in the book of life and so he who is the one that overcometh first John 5 uh, for whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world and this is the victory that overcometh the world even our faith who is he that overcometh the world but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God and it continues on but basically the point I want to say is if you're uh, a believer in Christ that your name is in the book of life and he will not blot out your name there uh, Revelation 20 and I saw a great white throne and him that sat upon it and then him that sat on it his face uh, the earth and the heaven fled away and there was found no place for them and I saw the dead the small and great stand before God and the books were open and another book was open which is the book of life and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to the works and the sea gave up the dead which were in it and death and hell were uh, delivered up the dead which were in them and they were judged every man according to the works and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire this is the second death and whatsoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire sorry and whosoever was not found in the book, written in the book of life so if you're saved obviously you're not here but what we see in the story is this these books and then there's the the book of life is what it says right there's books and then um, he opened up another book which is the book of life so I think God is judging these people obviously of the sins and the deeds that they've done and then he looks into the book of life so you have these books and the book of life this is how at least I'm picturing it um, and so if he sees your name not there which people obviously that aren't saved aren't there uh, he's gonna cast you into the lake of fire all right, so I'm thankful God has saved me this morning and so should you all right so Revelation 17 uh, the beast 
that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend up uh, out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder, whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. So I think some Calvinists would use this like, hey, you know, God picked names and his name, he's written the names uh, from the foundation of the world. Uh, but I don't think that's the case. <coughs> uh, I, th I just think it's, it's the book that was from the foundation of the world, the book of life from the foundation of the world. And because names can change, right? Um, and I think Exodus 32 even um, clarifies this further. And Moses returned unto the Lord and said, oh this, my, uh, oh, this people have sinned a great sin and have made them gods of gold. Yet now, if thou would forgive their sin, if not blot me, I pray thee out of thy book which thou hast written. And the Lord said unto Moses, Whosoever hath sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. So if he's picked the names before the foundation of the world, um, at what point does he blot them out, right? So someone sins and then they get blotted out of the book. So if the names were from the foundation of the world, um, they wouldn't have needed to be blotted out eventually is what I'm trying to make of that point. Uh, so basically, uh, if you think of, remember it says in Romans, uh, for I was alive once, but when, this, when the law entered, um, I died. So that's when, obviously, I think is when your name is blood, uh, uh, blood out of the book. All right, so uh, what do I have here? Sorry, just bear with me a moment. Oh, yeah, okay. So Luke 1, And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. Uh, and behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. So names aren't always obviously fixed. Um, the point I wanted to make here also is that uh, even Jesus um, in, in the book, in the Bible, is also known as, uh, in, another, in another way to say it, is Joshua. Because um, we obviously have Jesus, um, our Savior, um, the Lord. But um, in Acts 7, if you read actually the stories, um, that's, our fathers had the tabernacle witness in the wilderness, as he had appointed, speaking unto Moses, that he should make it according to the fashion that he had seen, which also our fathers that came brought in with Jesus into the possession of the Gentiles. So it's actually talking about uh, Joshua um, leading the Israelites into the promised land, whom God drove out from before the face of our fathers unto the days of David. So even uh, you see in the, throughout the Bible, Old, New Testament, Old and Testament and New Testament, words are um, quoted differently and even names are pronounced differently in that case. You know, we have like Elias or Elijah, uh, um, Noe and Noah, right? So you have different names um, pronounced differently. So I don't think it's necessarily uh, the name um, is fixed when it's written, right? So we see the name can be blotted out and it can be changed later on, as we saw earlier, when God changed the name and people changed their names. Um, and apostles are sold to Paul. So I believe it would have been Paul that um, has his name in the book of life. All right, so this is also talking about Joshua, um, but they use the name Jesus uh, in this case. Um, but I won't read it for sake of time. So that sort of segues to my last uh, section, which is uh, the name of God. Oh, sorry, before that, Judges 12. Um, if you had to have a name, uh, whether it's a person or if you had to, you know, we read the Bible says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So that name, which name is it? That name, do we have to say it right? Because you hear a group where, you know, it's Yeshua, it's, it's, uh, it's you know, you hear that name, Yeshua. It's, you got to go by um, that name, Yeshua. But I don't think that's the case. You know, we'll see soon that God uh, showed us his names. And he wasn't so fixated on which name he used, but it was we knew who it was we were talking about. And so in this case, we see in Judges 12, uh, the Gileadites took their passage of Jordan before the Ephra Ephraimites, and it was so that when those Ephraimites, which were escaped, said, let me go over, uh, that the men of Gilead said unto me, art thou an Ephraimite? If he said nay, then said they unto him, say now Shibboleth. And he said, Shibboleth, Sibboleth, for he could not uh, frame to pronounce it right, then they took him and slew him at the passages of Jordan there, and there they fell at that time of the Ephraimites, 40 and 2,000. So even this group of people that are similar in the same area, so Ephraim and, and Manasseh was basically shared the same area, you know, they would have spoken the similar things. Uh, they would have spoken similar languages, but here, even in this case, uh, their pronunciation, the way they said things were different, you know, uh, even in the same similar people group. So some people that are so fixated on, on God's name or uh, the name, uh, we see in the Bible even that people had different ways to pronounce things. You know, are we supposed to say uh, Jesus 
the way you say it, or do we say it, you know, um, in another way, you have to pronounce the S's and the U properly. I don't think that's so, so, so much the case. As we get into the name of God, we shall see. And um, remember, I said this verse earlier, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So who is the name of the Lord in Genesis? Um, as we see here, then men, then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. So even from basically the second generation, you know, when the population of humanity was less than 100, people started getting saved. They become, became called upon the name of the Lord. So from the day dot, um, you know, people knew God and how to be saved. But what was that name? Calling upon the name of the Lord. And we even see Abraham, uh, Abraham called upon the name of the Lord in Genesis 13, 4. But let's see in Exodus 3, where God is sort of explaining uh, his name here. And Moses said unto God, Who am I that I should go unto Pharaoh and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? And he said, Certainly I will be with thee, and this shall be a token unto thee that I have sent thee. When thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, ye shall serve God upon this mountain. And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers hath sent me unto you. And they shall say, and say to me, What is his name? And what shall I say to, unto them? Uh, and God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. So God here is saying, uh, His name is I am, that I am, and also that I am. So simply, uh, in a sense, to exist, that He is God. That's what God is saying to Moses to say who He is, that I am, that I am. That is the name of God here. But is that the name they called upon to be saved? Uh, we see in Exodus 6, that's not the case. God spake unto Moses and said unto him, I am the Lord, and I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob, by the name of God Almighty. But by my name, Jehovah, was I not known to them? So remember in Genesis 22, where it was Jehovah Jireh, but we read a bit later on, um, oh sorry, before that, uh, that he appeared to Abraham as Almighty God, the name Almighty God. So here we have eventually uh, Abraham knowing the name of God. By the name God Almighty, but by my name Jehovah, was I not known to them. So obviously we did not know, they did not know the name Jehovah, so that's, they were calling upon the name of God Almighty. And so we're not to be so much fixed on uh, when, we, when we're saying the sinner's prayer, whose, whose name uh, are we praying upon? Obviously, as New Testament believers, languages are established. We have English already. We already know the name of God, Jesus Christ. And that is the name we will use. Um, and I think that's how it works, right? So um, <clears throat> we see here other verses um, where God's showing his other name, uh, jealous, for thou shalt worship no other God, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. So God is not so fixed on, I guess, his name in that sense, but we know who we are calling upon. Uh, we, were, we know who we're calling upon, Jesus Christ. So how I think it works, because we have this verse in Acts 4.12, uh, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. And that similar accounts to Romans 10, right? For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord. This is how I think it works in verse 14. Right? So we have... Um, if, if I was to go to India for, uh, for the sake of illustration, right? I know Jesus in, in English. Uh, sorry, Jesus is in, in English. But if we will go to others, other uh, countries, uh, they would know the name differently. Right? So there's uh, Yasu, in, um, in an, I think in Arabic. Or Yesu in Chinese, if, I'm, if I know correctly. But, um, and it's not Isa as... Uh, as the uh, people of Islam say, you know, it's Isa. No, I think it's, it's Yasu. If you're a Christian of Arabic um, speaking, I think it's Yasu. But remember, the name's not so fixed. It's the one we know who we're calling upon, the Savior, the Lord Jesus, uh, our Lord Jesus. But we know and identify that it's the Savior. Uh, we, we know it is. Because if you're, if you're going to, I think how it works is basically um, before they knew the name, someone had to preach to them, right? So, um, the person that's preaching to them obviously is saved. He knows who God is. He knows how to explain the differences between uh, the real true God and the false gods. So as we see here, um, how shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? Um, so it's basically uh, from the preacher um, preaching the word and um, they're explaining who God is. And so whatever language they're using, um, in English, it's obviously established, Jesus Christ. Um, in other languages, in Spanish, like um, Jesus, 
right? They would use Jesus. Um, and that's how it would be. Those languages are established. And so we're not just going to make the names of God, just make up willy, uh, free, um, just making up freely a name, just choose a name, that's God. No, I don't think that's the case. Unless you're establishing a new language and making a, a full dictionary, I don't think we would do that. But we see in Acts 2 um, what exactly happened, where people started preaching of God and speaking to each other about God. And this is obviously the place where they spoke in tongues. Right, and so let's verse two, jump to verse 4. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, uh, out of every nation under heaven. Um, and so let's jump to verse 7. And they were all amazed, marveled, saying one to the other, Behold, are, are not all these which spake Galileans? And how we hear every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? So, how I, I understand it to work is, you know, when. Uh, as a preacher, you go into people that are lost, you already know how to explain God, who He is, and His name. And that's the name you will use to preach to these people, and that's who the name they will call upon. Um, and in our sense, in English, it's Jesus Christ. Um, and so that, I think that's how it works in that sense. The person that's preaching the name, that saved person that already knows God, is delivering that name, is delivering the word. All right? So. Um, in that sense also, as believers, we should not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Some of us, you know, we say the name of God uh, freely. You know, we use him as an expletive in some tense, senses. We should take God's name and hold it with reverence and respect. If God was before us right now, you know, we would, we would be fallen before our face. We would be like so afraid and fearful of him. And yet some of us take his name so casually. And so we shouldn't we do that. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Right, so one way it's done is Leviticus 18, and thou shalt not let any of thy seed pass through the fire to Molech. All right, so neither shalt thou profane the name of thy God. So, as parents, you know, we should care for our children what they do, that they should serve God. We shouldn't let them serve themselves, we shouldn't let them serve things of this world, the flesh, or uh, the false gods, you know, the, fo the, the God of social media, the God of, you know, the false gods of um, being self. Of themselves basically you know don't pass or don't let your seed pass through the fire to Molech you shouldn't profane the name of thy God raise your children in the name of God to know your word to sing his praises and to be surrounded with God's people and not to the things of this world all right so same thing here in Leviticus 23 Matthew 5 um, also as believers we shouldn't swear oaths again you have heard uh, that it hath been said of them of old time thou shalt not swear for thyself for, to, for swear thyself but, that, but shalt perform unto the Lord thine earth. But I say unto you, swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by earth, for it is his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Neither shalt thou swear by thy head, because thou canst not make one hair black or white. Let your communication be yea, yea, nay, nay, for whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil. All right, so what I have here, you know, in primary school, we had um, a lot of cases where would, would tell my friend, I'd tell my friends, oh, you give me this, I'll give this back to you. Or, um, and you try to make an oath, right? And they'll say sometimes, like, I swear to God. And they'll say that. And uh, we even have that danger in um, altar calls in youth camps and sometimes there's big conferences like, you know, make a promise to God. Make, a, make an oath to God. I don't think we should do that as Christians, you know? If you had to make an oath, you know what you have a problem with? It's accountability problem or a credibility problem. If you can't just say, if your word is not like, sure what people have to say are you sure are you promised to me you'll make an oath you have a credibility issue so what we hear what we see in matthew 5 is let our uh, belated communication be yay yay nay nay so as people and believers of god you know we have to have that character where we work hard and what's what we say we will do we will do it and we didn't have to make an oath as we saw uh, jephthah with his daughter unfortunately right so don't make an oath uh, either by heaven or god's name or by things on earth Moving on, um, we see people taking God's name in vain by uh, not actually preaching what God said to them. We see in Jeremiah 23, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, hearken not unto the words of the prophets that prophesy unto you. They make you vain, they speak a vision of their own heart, and not out of the mouth of the Lord. They say still unto them that despise me, the Lord hath said, Ye shall have peace, and they say unto everyone that walketh after the imagination of their own heart. No evil shall come upon you. For who hath stood in the counsel of the Lord and hath perceived and heard his word? Who hath marked his word and heard it? Um, behold, the whirlwind of the Lord is gone in a, forth in a fury, even a grievous whirlwind. It is full 
it shall fall grievously upon the head of the wicked. The anger of the Lord shall not return until he have executed, until he have performed the thoughts of his heart. In the latter days, he, he shall consider it. Jesus, God said, I have not sent these prophets, yet they ran. I have not spoken to them, yet they prophesied. So sometimes you hear, you see YouTube, Christian channels, they say, God told me this is going to happen. God said this. Or someone or a believer says, God told me to say this to you. I don't think we should say that. I don't think we should do that as believers. You know, I think we should just open up the word like, hey, you know, I think that what you're, with, what, um, what you're doing is not wise, that this is what I see from the Bible, the, the patterns that we should follow after. We shouldn't go to people or we shouldn't go to places and say, you know, God had told me this to say to you. Unless it's directly a text from the word of God, right? Because it says this in First Peter 1, um, for, we have to for we received from God the Father, uh, honor and glory and where where there came such a voice from to him from the excellent glory this is my beloved son in whom i am well pleased and this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount we have also a more sure word of prophecy um where unto you do well that you take heed so even more than the voice that they heard from heaven they have a more sure word of prophecy in the bible so some people they say i heard i heard from god i saw a vision from god we have the Bible. We have a more sure word of prophecy. If it's not coming from the Bible, I don't, I'm, so, I'm not going to really think about what you're saying. I want to see it from the Bible. We have a more sure word of prophecy. Right? And so I sort of want to close here. Second Chronicles 7. Um, <clears throat> let's go jump to verse 14, just for sake of time. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will hear their land. So as people, once again, the names of God, the names of people, places and things, we ought to surname ourselves of the nation of Israel. We are God's people. Um, you know, we are that song, a year, a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. Um, they should show forth the praises of him. Who hath called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. All right, so we are a people, a God's people. And if you're far from God this morning, if you're far from God, you just walked away from God, you haven't picked up the word of you haven't picked up the word or the Bible in a while. Why don't you go back to God? Humble yourselves, pray and seek his face. You know, if you regard iniquity in your heart, the Lord will not hear you. But if you go to God humbly, you can enter his throne of grace freely, and he will answer you. You know, so um, Philippians 2. We think, and we think about how great God is. You know, when you, if you're ever down in a time in life, you just remember how God, great God is. That if God be for us, who can be against us? Who can stand before us? We have God to us. And not Allah, not Vishnu, not Buddha. We have Jesus, God Almighty. And so, you know, inspired by, you know, some songs in, in the Bible, I sort of made a poem. I, I don't have it here, so I had to memorize it. It's quite a lengthy one. I think it's pretty cool. And I'm going to muck it up because I tried rehearsing this poem or this thought. But basically, with this idea of Philippians 2 and um, the name of God, that we should be uh, bold about it, that we should stand forth uh, for God. You know, who, who do we have? You know, we have the creator of heaven and earth, the creator of the universe. You know, the Bible says, He is the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. He is the author and finisher of our faith. He is without father, without mother, without beginning of days, nor end of life, without descent, sorry. Uh, who is made like the Son of God, abideth the priest continually. He is from everlasting to everlasting. He is the ancient of days. He is the Amen. I am so glad, you know what, that He is the rock of my salvation. Oh, how firm a foundation. Right? He is my shield, my defender, my fortress, my buckler. My strong tower, my stone. And regarding stones and rocks, you know, the Bible says he is the stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner. And the Bible says he is that chief cornerstone. And like the Song of, Song of Solomon's, the chiefest among 10,000. And uh, Jesus Christ himself said that he is uh, the door. He is the light of the world. And like the manna from heaven we saw earlier in Exodus, you know, he is the bread of life. Um, and the Bible says he, he is... The way, the truth, and the life, no man cometh unto the Father but by him. He is the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in him should not perish, um, but hath everlasting life. He that believeth in him shall not see death, but is passed from death unto life. He that believeth in him, though he were dead, yet shall he live. He is a faithful and true witness. 
He is the true one. His word is truth. He is the word of truth, and he is the truth. I am so glad that he is my savior, right? The Bible says uh, he is the star out of Jacob, that he is the bright and morning star. He is the one that makes the seven stars. And Orion, he is the one that stretched out the earth above the waters. And he is the fountain of living waters. And his earth is for, sorry, his throne is forever and ever. The earth is his footstool. You know, that is the God we serve. Uh, immutable, he cannot change. And, it, and his eternal reign will praise him. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That is my Savior. That is God who we serve. <clears throat> he is a lion out of the tribe of Judah. Um, he is the God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob. He is the root and the offspring of David. And uh, Abraham was glad to see his day. You know, the Pharisees couldn't agree against him. The Sadducees were sad to see him. Pilate couldn't find a fault in him. The grave and the death could not hold him. And resurrected, we praise him. And that is God who we serve, uh, God Almighty. <clears throat> and so when you think about how great God is, that he is Almighty God, <clears throat> that he is uh, <clears throat> the word of truth, Jesus Christ, and all his names and his titles that we have, right, and his power, that he is omnipotent, all-powerful, omniscient, all-knowing, uh, omnipresent everywhere at the same time eternally he which was which is which was which is to come that is jesus christ and um that god himself uh we see in isaiah says he is wonderful counsel of the mighty god the everlasting father the prince of peace john says he's like uh we see that there are three that bear record in heaven the father the word and the holy ghost and these three are one uh and we have jesus christ god the image of the eternal god the word of god in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, the Word of God, our Comforter, our Redeemer, our Savior, our Friend, our, our High Priest, our Holy One, the Mediator between God and men, the Man Christ Jesus, uh, the Holy One, high and lifted up, God Himself. You know, the Bible says to the King, immortal, invisible, the only uh, invisible God, and that uh, He is great God. He is a mighty God. He is a Buckler. He is dreadful and he is terrible. And because you think about it, that he says, The vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. And so at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father, the King of kings, the Lord of gods, the Lord of lords, the Almighty God. That is our God and that is who we serve. So let's pray and I'll take the name of God with you. <clears throat> Dear God, I just thank you uh, that you have saved us, um, that we can be called of your name. And um, we're all just sinners, but you've taken all our sins away and that you've imputed unto us your righteousness. I thank you, Jesus, um, for what you've done. And I uh, just pray as we saw some stories today, I hope we took some things away from here that we encouraged and motivated. Uh, this week we go to work, we work harder, um, being as Christians, being identified as uh, believers, as we bear your name and take the name with you, our name, your name with us as we go out. And I pray that we preach boldly, uh, preaching your name freely, and that people will call upon your name. And I pray that your name be worshipped, magnified, and glorified. I thank you, Jesus, for your word. Pray for your mercy and grace. We have good fellowship today. Bless the food. I ask all these things in your name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. All right.